It's the F-bomb of politics. The rhetorical nuclear option. Succeed in attaching this label to your opponent and it'll cast instant doubt on their very humanity. Fascism. You're a fascist for believing that. He's a fascist. Fucking fascist! But what is fascism? What separates it from the other deadly isms? And is there a new growth of fascism happening in this new century? Seems like the concept of fascism is everywhere these days. In Europe, fledgling nationalist movements are on the rise. And in America, radical groups like Antifa have sprung up to combat what they consider to be fascist tendencies on the political right. Both sides display a tendency towards violence and authoritarianism to advance their ends. But when the word fascism gets thrown around so much, it's hard to know what it really means. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. George Orwell made this point in 1944, writing that the word fascism is almost entirely meaningless. Almost any English person would accept bully as a synonym for fascism. Finding fascism precisely is a tricky thing. Because of its populist nature, it differs in every country where it's applied. Here's how the Italian fascist dictator Benito Mussolini described his vision of the fascist state. The citizen in the fascist state is no longer a selfish individual who has the antisocial right of rebelling against any law of the collectivity. In contrast, the Nazi tyrant Adolf Hitler's definition put more emphasis on the state's control of private property. The state should retain supervision and each property owner should consider himself appointed by the state. It is his duty not to use his property against the interests of others among his own people. This is the crucial matter. The Third Reich will always retain its right to control the owners of property. Unlike the other isms, fascism sprang not from a consistent ideology, but rather as an opportunistic play on the emotions of the people. And this explains why it's so difficult to pin down. Alluding to this, Mussolini was known to quip that he himself was the definition of fascism. So one key thing about Mussolini was the fact he was a mastermind of, of the language. He could talk in the same language people talk. He could make an impression upon them by speaking in a simple, accessible way. Uh, he knew which chords he needed to play in order to get into you know, the, the collective mind, uh, so to say. Is the resurgence of fascism a threat we should take seriously? Or is it just a relic of the 20th century, only applicable to textbooks and history lessons? To answer this question, we need to look at what exactly fascism is and where it came from. Today, Europe is rife with fascist movements stretching across a dozen countries. What unites these movements under a single term is the way they appeal to populist impulse using the idea of national mythology and the creation of an enemy against which to rally popular unrest. For example, in Italy, the birthplace of fascism, Mussolini tapped into popular support by hearkening back to the glory days of the Roman Empire. Nationalism is always about a mythical past, um, and Mussolini's mythical past was the Roman Empire, so the empire he established, the empire he tried to establish, was to be some sort of a Roman empire reloaded. Uh, there was preposterous, Italy was never going to rule the world, uh, but it was enough to keep up with the fantasy uh, of the people. By promising a return to a mythologized past, he was able to rally his people, direct corporate activity towards the national interest, and set up non-Italians as a scapegoat for all of the country's domestic problems. Yet for all of his talk about strength and national pride, Mussolini was at times chillingly frank about his goals. The fascist state organizes the nation, but leaves a sufficient margin of liberty to the individual. The latter is deprived of all useless and possibly harmful freedom 
but retains what is essential. The deciding power in this question cannot be the individual, but the state alone. In Germany, Adolf Hitler took these ideas even further, implementing fascism in its most extreme form. Hitler was obsessed with the myth of the Aryan race and the strength and militarism of Teutonic mythology. For a scapegoat, he chose the Jewish people with horrific consequences. The problem with manufacturing an enemy to consolidate power is that you have to keep coming up with new bogeymen. Mussolini initially targeted his political opponents, but as Italy's economic and military problems worsened, he was forced to export violence to Africa, killing hundreds of thousands of people, and eventually even turning on his own people, adopting the German version of anti-Semitism under pressure from his ally, Hitler. This need to keep the masses afraid and motivated stems from the fact that fascism is a fundamentally reactionary movement. Before the 20th century, most of Europe was ruled by unelected monarchs who could govern however they pleased. With democracy, however, it became necessary to exploit popular sentiment in order to gain power. And since fascism's economic nationalism inevitably leads to negative consequences for those under its rule, Leaders have to resort to greater and greater extremes. Mussolini drove Italy's economy into the ground, indulged in mass murder abroad, and got Italy into a losing war, all in a desperate attempt to remain in control. When he was finally deposed, the citizens of Italy strung him upside down and kicked and beat him to death. The charismatic leader who had promised them eternal glory was reduced to an unrecognizable pulp at the hands of those he had duped. Socialism and nationalism are traditionally viewed as opposites, but in reality, much of the difference comes from the way they try to divide society. Socialism divides society horizontally, by class and wealth. Fascism does it vertically, by nationality, race, or ethnicity. In other words, the fascists were more interested in where you came from rather than your social station. And although the fascists remained opposed to the forces of communism and socialism, many of their leaders started out as committed socialists sharing that ideology's fondness for authoritarianism and distrust of markets. These seemingly contradictory positions led to some confusion among the early supporters of fascism. Distressed by the fast-growing and aggressive communist movements across the continent, some of Europe's traditional right-wing, conservatives, and even some classical liberals were tempted to side with the fascists. They overlooked that the enemy of their enemy was not their friend. Fascists didn't think of themselves as on the political left or right. Their appeal to national traditions, patriotism, and a strong military allowed them to gain support among European conservatives. This is why most people consider fascism a right-wing movement today. It was also around this time that Antifa first arose in opposition to European fascism. But then, as now, it was an explicitly communist movement that viewed fascism as a natural outgrowth of capitalism. Just because a movement opposes fascism doesn't mean they value liberty. Once again, the enemy of our enemy is not our friend. Fascism has never been a uniquely European phenomenon. At the end of the 1920s, the Great Depression had left the American economy in ruins. Citing the need to pull the country together, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt greatly increased government's control of private business. In the working out of a great national program that seeks the primary good of the greater number, 
it is cruel that the toes of some people are being stepped on and are going to be stepped on. The National Recovery Act was a sweeping plan that imposed fixed prices, minimum wages, and production quotas from the top down. While business nominally remained in private hands, all of the key decisions on how to run the economy came from the government. It wasn't capitalism because owners of private property could not engage in real market competition and use it as they saw fit, but it wasn't socialism either because the argument was it wasn't, it wasn't tr totally planning the economy. It was this kind of cartel controlled command system, right, that, that was an attempt to capture what they thought was the best of both systems. Um, not unlike, I mean, the lighter version of that is some things that we saw in the New Deal, certainly the first New Deal in the United States, which was in many ways sort of consciously seen as another third way between capitalism and, and, and socialism. Because the perception, of course, was capitalism had caused the Great Depression. Roosevelt led the charge to buy American, repeating the persuasive lie that foreign trade is bad for the economy. This kind of economic nationalism contributed towards the fascist influence demonization of the other and convinced the public that government control of the economy was protecting them while at the same time promoting national greatness. The newspaper of the Nazi party was enthusiastic about Roosevelt's adoption of national socialist strains of thought in his economic and social policies. Mussolini was also vocal in his praise of the New Deal, calling it boldly interventionist in the field of economics and saying that Roosevelt understood the principle that the state no longer leaves the economy to its own devices. Mussolini's admiration for FDR wasn't one-sided. The president said that he was envious of the Italian government at the time, calling it the most efficiently operating piece of social machinery I've ever seen. In hindsight, the only thing efficient about fascism is the brutality with which it was implemented. It's tempting to view fascism as a historical relic, a 20th century dinosaur that we no longer have to worry about. Sadly, that's not the case. The sense that national identities are slipping away under a tide of globalism has led to a rash of new nationalist movements all across the globe. Neo-Nazis are being spotted all across Europe. And in Russia, Vladimir Putin's government bears a marked similarity to 20th century fascism. Even the USA is not immune. The rise of fascism on American college campuses. A rise of extreme fascist nationalism. <laughs> Demagoguery on the evils of foreign trade has led many people towards a mistaken view that isolating our economy from the rest of the world can somehow make us richer. That American workers should not be forced to compete against people in Mexico or people in China who are making pennies an hour. That's unfair. We must protect our borders from the ravages of other countries making our products, stealing our companies, and destroying our jobs. When in fact, protectionism only impoverishes American consumers while handing over more control of private business to the government. Meanwhile, endless foreign wars with no clear objective and no timeline for victory are reminiscent of fascism's need for a scapegoat to distract voters from problems at home, as well as to justify the creeping surrender of our civil liberties. Activist groups on both the left and the right are becoming increasingly intolerant of one another. And willing to use violence to advance their respective causes. Mark Twain supposedly once quipped that history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. The echoes we are now seeing, both from the explicit fascism of neo-Nazi movements and the more subtle variety of economic nationalism that is gaining popularity, should be concerning to anyone familiar with the events of the last century. Thank you.